Most of us have had some kind of familiarity with the broad brushstrokes of Scripture. We know where it starts in Genesis and creation. We see the great white throne judgment and the new heaven and the new earth. And we have an understanding of the personal call of God in our lives. We see that humans are of particular interest of God, to God. He creates us in his image and likeness. And in Christ, we become image bearers of Christ, even as Jesus is an image bearer of the Father. And, um, and so we spend our lives exploring the scriptures, how it applies to today, what happened in the past, and what the future holds. Number one, we explore the scriptures so that we can understand. That's very important in order that we may live godly lives, and the third one, in order that we may have a testimony. So we study the scriptures that we can understand, and as God's Spirit works with us. We study the scriptures in order to how to live a godly life, keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. And the third item is that we can have a testimony, something of truth that comes out of our mouths that witnesses to a greater glory. But then there are some passages of the scripture that can make small boys hide under their dunas a night in fear. One lady said to me, I don't read the Bible to my children because it's so much violence. And there are other, for me as a little boy, I would think about beasts in Revelation and the great images portrayed in, in, in prophecy, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I thought, I'll never get married. I want to see nuclear war in my lifetime. And, and I, I, you know, so not only as I was a small boy afraid of it, it messed me around, those in Scripture like Isaiah, like Daniel, like John, who received visions of, of, of a godly understanding, an overall view, were terrified at what they saw. And sometimes we look at those prophecies, a couple come to mind. Daniel interprets a vision of a terrifying statue, a head of gold, chest of silver, belly of bronze, irons, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. Daniel has a dream of a terrible iron-toothed beast that tramples everything under its foot. Now, we can go to the book of Revelation, and John sees a similar vision of beasts, etc. And other prophets also experience various things. So you can see where I'm, I'm going to lead this. This is a limb leading to the preeminence of Jesus Christ. But I'm starting there to be able to show that there are parts of Scripture that if we don't know what they're anchored to, it's going to leave us with nightmares at night. But we know, and let me preempt this, all these things are centred on Jesus Christ. And when they, we understand the victory that we have in Jesus, now I've just given away the punchline, then we can read it within context. And we have the peace of God that passes all understanding to keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Well, the first scripture that I want to bring on the screen comes from Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, behold, a great image, this mighty this image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. It affected Nebuchadnezzar so much that he couldn't hardly remember the dream. He had this memory of this terror that he'd experienced, and Daniel provides the dream. And he describes the different metals that make up the, the image. The head of gold was the Babylonian Empire. The, the silver, as you know, was the Persian Empire. Then we have the Greek, and we have finally have the Roman Empire, right through to the time, to the very end, when the feet of iron and clay. If I drop down, I don't have that. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and gold, all together were broken in pieces by a rock that was cut out with our, our hands, picturing Jesus. It became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. So the terror of this great image ends up to where you can't even find it anymore because of the rock of Jesus. Keep that in mind, because anything of this portent like this that affected Nebuchadnezzar that was frightening to him, finds its ultimate anchoring within Jesus Christ. But the stone that struck the image became, in, in, in verse 36, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled earth, and that was a dream that terrified the king that Daniel interpreted. Now Daniel in chapter 7, and I'll bring those, that verse on the screen, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, now I'm reading from the English Standard Version, After this I saw in the night visions, behold a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and exceedingly strong. Now, when a man says it was terrifying, it affected him. You know, it was terrifying, it was dreadful, it was extremely strong, it had great iron teeth. 
It devoured and broke in pieces. It stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. Now, I've been to some Bible studies, and I remember going to a Seventh-day Adventist Bible study that spent months working through the book of Daniel. And there were some aspects of it that, you know, that were quite encouraging and others challenging, really challenging, that, that by the Holy Spirit, visions were given of explanations that pointed towards a particular direction. If you didn't know where the direction pointed to, man, it would leave you with nightmares as you tried to understand it. And so I've been parts of, um, I've seen parts of churches who've spent many, many years, a lot of efforts and energies, based on prophetic interpretation, 1260 days, seven, you know, all the prophecies, trying to work out things and, and finding themselves so far on a left limb because we don't fully understand it, unless we see it in a particular context. In Revelation, this is John, I'm going to bring the first three, um, 11, 13, 11 to 13, um, of, of Revelation 13, John says, I saw another beast, so he'd seen other things preceding that, rising out of the earth, it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beasts of its in, in its presence, and it makes the earth and all its inhabitants worship the beast. So it forces something on society whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven on earth, to earth in front of people. Now I won't read the rest of Revelation, but for John, he saw something terrifying, and it plays into a particular context. In fact, you read a few verses on, you see all of society is manipulated in their buying and their selling and their trading. Now, if you were to close the book at that point, and you think, well, I'm not going to read this, too much of this, it's going to give my children nightmares, even myself, I'll be haunted by the daunting nature of this kind of imagery. We might ask, is it in my children's lifetime? Is it in my lifetime? What do I do with this? The secret, important thing to remember as we explore a little bit, as we have explored a little bit of this imagery, just as a taste, the what's, the why's, the how's have a bigger context in which they fit. And when you understand the sovereignty of that bigger context, we'll rejoice along with the rest of the saints. It's a part of a bigger painting, a part of a bigger picture. I have friends who are really immersed in prophetic interpretation. Some people here in Australia belong to a particular branch of a church of God. And Jesus was prophesied to return on, on Pentecost, summer May 2008. Then there was a prophecy that he'd return in 2012. And then there was a prophecy he would return in 2013. Then he prophesied it would happen in 2019, and now he's saying May the 31st, 2020. So you have a culture, a congregation of people who are living on the precipice of the predictive addiction of it, and I'm thinking, oh, never coming nearer to Christ, but always immersed in this haunting imagery where the brush strokes of Scripture are pointing to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, but unfortunately the people never come to Jesus. They're always with beasts and images and, 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 and predictive um, speculation. And um, so if those images given to those original prophets, Isaiah, I think we have some in Ezekiel, um, we have um, Daniel, we have um, John in Revelation, if they were terrifying to the original recipients, how do you read them? How do you see them? Do they bother you? Do you just smile about it? Or do you just dismiss it and just leave it on the, on the shelf? One of the number, the most important thing is to understand their true context. How, what ties it together? Why did God present that? Why, you know, mess about with us? Then we can ask how great those visions are, or might I add, really just how small they are, given the overall picture. See, for example, there were people in Jesus' day, namely the Pharisees, but there were others who spent a lifetime researching the Scriptures. Why? Because they wanted eternal life. So they lived by the words of God with great application and diligence in order that they may have life. But Jesus said, all of those Scriptures speak of me, and you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They could quote Torah by heart. They knew the Psalms. They knew the prov wise writings. They knew the words of the prophets. They understood it to a certain degree. But because, um, in Jesus' view, he called them sepulchres full of dead men's bones, like zombies, the walking dead. 
Because Jesus, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they refused Jesus. So you can have all this knowledge and all this interpretation, and without Jesus, you are simply the walking and talking dead. Now, can I remind you, or remind us, that that was the Apostle Paul, known as Saul, before he met Jesus? For all his greatness, for all his hereditary, for all his experience of circumcision and studying at the feet of Felita Gamaliel, he was, in Jesus' eye, the walking, talking dead, pursuing Christ. And, um, and as we near the Lord's Supper, the Christ Passover, celebrating the bread and the wine and the foot washing, I share this message because I want us to contemplate the meaning of redemption, the power of the great sacrifice that Jesus went through and what we experience as we enter into covenant through baptism and the richness that we have in this new creation life that gives us victory overall only in Jesus Christ. It's important to see what the Pharisees, for all their learning, including the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, did not see. They could not see Jesus. They did not see Jesus. All that the prophets pointed to, pointed to Jesus. And in fact, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, you're so blessed. All those that have written about me, all the prophets, all the writings, they long to see it. And here I am in your midst. I'm paraphrasing. So what did the prophets point to with all those terrifying images of things that we people we wrestle with? How can we bring it down to some sort of digestible size that it's within context? Because to preach the word of God out of context is to almost perpetuate the lie. You know, the devil did that. You know, you shall be like God, knowing good and evil, he said to Eve. Taking something out of context, presenting it falsely, becomes a lie. You know, and the question is, how do we see human history? Past, present, and future. And our part in it, in the name of Jesus Christ. The clues throughout the scriptures are there. They're everywhere, and they're plenty. And I want to start with Apostle Paul. Because something in um, Colossians chapter 1, and I'll bring that up on screen, he talks about the preeminence of Christ. Whatever you see, whatever you do, if you view it through the lens of the preeminence of Christ, you see the trunk of the tree and you see the branches that are peripheral, how all focus on Jesus. And I want to read that because the preeminence in, of Christ means in all that we see, all that we hear, all that we desire and aspire to, everything that we reason, above all ideas, above all people, above all things, above all kingdoms, is Jesus Christ. Let's read this. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Colossians 1 verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So you want to know what God looks like? We look at Jesus. For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. Now this is one of Paul's most powerful writings. And in him all things hold together. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. Who might be preeminent? Jesus. For what? In everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is the Jesus where all the prophecies point to. This is the Jesus of the new covenant, and that, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus affirms this preeminence in Matthew 28 when he's commissioning his disciples. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's preeminence. And only Jesus can make that claim. Jesus shows how it relates to us. John 14, 20. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, image bearer of the Father, and that you and me and I in you. That you and me and I in you is the covenant relationship we will celebrate on Thursday night. Us in Christ, and Christ in us. So when we are baptised, we are baptised in Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, baptise them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But when we read Acts 2.38, a few examples of the people 
in the first century what they experienced. And Peter said to them, that's on the Pentecost experience, repent, Acts 2.38, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So at some point, <coughs> we, experienced, we experienced and undertook total surrender to Jesus. And we were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and that laying of hands bequeathed to us the Holy Spirit, the gift. Without the Holy Spirit, we would not have the strength, the will, the will, the light, or the capacity to live and understand and be faithful when Jesus returns. Acts 10, 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Romans 6, 3. Don't you all know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Galatians 3.27 For as many of you were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. So living in this world, those of us who are baptized become image bearers of Christ. John 14.20 I in you and you in me. And this is a reality. And in the outward expression of faith through the ritual of baptism, we acknowledge publicly within the community of faith that we have surrendered all to Jesus, we participate in his death, we have brought out a watering grave as a new creation. All our sins in the name of Jesus has been forgiven. Paul understood this in Galatians. Galatians 2.20 He identified with his old man being dead. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, the old Saul, but Christ who lives in me. That's powerful. So as we come together on Thursday night, hold that scripture in there, Christ lives in us. We are a new creation. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, willingly. We become image bearers of Jesus Christ to the degree that Jesus was an image bearer of the Father. And so we become a new creation with a new covenant um, and a new identity of Christ in us by the Holy Spirit. The converse, the opposite of that, anything short of that, is to live a life of being a walking dead. The whitewashed tombs that Jesus referred to of the Pharisees, the knowledgeable, biblical, literate people, they looked good on the outside, but inside Jesus said, you're full of dead men's bones, you're the walking dead because they didn't receive Jesus. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John 6.53 Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Wow, unless you enter into covenant with Jesus Christ, we have no life. That's a great tragedy. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, a little piece of bread that we take in symbolism, and drink his blood, the fruit of the vine, a little bit of grape juice, a little bit of wine, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood as an ongoing participation in the life of Christ, you know what the promise is? I will raise him up at the last day. You know, in Jesus, and in Jesus Christ alone, everything is brought to perspective. The peace of God that passes all understanding keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In fact, we have crossed over from death to life. Let's look at 1 John 5, 11, and verse 12. This is the testimony, says John writes, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, whoever has the Son has life, and who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's why when we pray in Jesus' name, it's so powerful. The most powerful part of our prayer, when we pray personally or corporately, is in the name of Jesus. And to have Jesus Christ is to bring everything into perspective, including ourselves. So I can ask a question that you already know. Why are we here today? Because God is reconciling us to himself through Jesus, and it's only by Jesus' blood. And the evidence finds its faith when we pray in Jesus' name. It's very powerful, very encouraging. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So if you actually wonder why society is on the slippery moral, moral slope of decline, it's because of the lie being perpetuated opposed to the truth. 
The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, verse 20, that we may know Him who is true and are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And what are the idols? The lies, the deceit, the distraction from fixing our eyes on anything else other than Jesus Christ. So who are we? We are in Jesus. And we see everything through that lens. All of the scriptures, the laments, the joys, the troubles, the brokenness that scriptures give testimony to, including the beasts and, 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 and images portraying apocalyptic themes, all find their reality in the sovereignty of Jesus. So we understand that all of Scripture, all of history, focuses on the Son of God. That it's only through the Son of God that we are being reconciled to the Father. So what God has done with us is brought us into covenant, sealed us with His Holy Spirit, that we, though we live in a perverse generation, we can be strong, encouraged, empowered by the Holy Spirit and have a testimony where we have a word that can glorify. See, at the end, as we look at the end of Daniel and we look at the Revelation, we see that the, the, the mighty beasts and the mighty images, those with iron teeth, are totally destroyed by the brightness of Jesus' coming. And Daniel says that they existed no more. This great golden image with, with iron legs just, just turned like straw and blew away at the power of Jesus' presence. And, um, and that rock cut out without human hands, the cornerstone upon which our faith is built. The Pharisees, the pre-Paul known as Saul, could not see Jesus. And Paul, in order for him to see, had to be blinded on the road to Damascus. So he finally could see what he could not see. John says, you search the scriptures. That could be talking to the Paul, the Saul, pre-Christ. You search the scriptures that in them you think you have eternal life. And Jesus says, these are they that speak of me. And Paul finally came to Christ that he may have eternal life. And Paul said, I count everything else as, as rubbish that I may gain Christ. I started out on a branch today, which is very important for us to understand the holistic story of redemption, of salvation, of wickedness, of evil, of the towering nature of the system of Babylon upon which we're a part of. Our Heavenly Father has called us on a radical, amazing journey. And we celebrate that in covenant, the new covenant that supersedes the old. You and are all of us submitted to Jesus Christ, to a new life, to experience a powerful grace. And all this leads to a glory where the former things become forgotten, death, mourning, tears, the wickedness, the beasts of the past, the images that dominated human history, all gone. In the name of Jesus, through Jesus, for the Father's glory. So this week... At 7 p.m., let's make sure we arrive a few minutes early, come prepared, and those of us encourage those of us, our children and grandchildren who are not yet baptized, to be willing ears to listen, to absorb the richness of who Jesus is under the terms of the new covenant, and to desire partaking of the same bread and the same body of Christ. May we come ready, because the participating of what we're doing under the new covenant points to something in the future when the final consummation will happen at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus, I will not again drink the fruit of the vine until I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. The terrifying images, the beasts of prophecy, find their true context and victory in our lives in Jesus Christ. Unless we're in Christ, unless Christ is in us, will be forever haunted by a level of uncertainty. But only in Christ do we have courage, strength. Only do we see and experience His preeminence do we have victory. Celebrated in covenant in Jesus' name. May we all have a blessed service next Thursday night in the name of Jesus.